Commission reports are usually considered a sort of text, a text type and literally a text sort that is, whose adherence to writing conventions such as facticity and strict non-fictionality is as strong as their distance from formats known from popular culture such as potboiler novels, thriller movies or for that matter graphic novels is great. Producers or writers of this text type, that is commission members along with skilled staff, will by the same token respond with unease and maybe even disgust if their output is measured against the standards of popular culture or literary criticism. I will in the following 22 minutes <laughs> try to demonstrate that the surprise bestseller 9-11 Commission Report launched in July 2004 an officially named final report on the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks against the United States is a remarkable exception to this rule. As can be shown, the commission under chairpersons Thomas H. Keene and Lee H. Hamilton has deliberately paved the way for a reception of its report in terms of the generic conventions known from popular literature and culture. I will more precisely analyze the report with tools borrowed from literary studies. Since this approach has been has already been undertaken by two critics. I will shortly resume their and my own findings before I search for explanations for the Commission members' unusual strategy of mingling bureaucratic prose with elements from suspense novels or films, or for that matter, their poetization of an originally politics specific text genre. I argue that it is for reasons of political ed calculation for the purpose of a collective working through maybe, and also even as a reaction to the unbearably more than real character of the terrorist attacks that the 9-11 Commission embraces rather than opposes a reception of its report as informed by literary role models. Ironically or not, this latter di diagnosis would put some of Jean Baudrillard's presumptions strongly debated by many and downright negated by some after the terror attacks, back into place. Subdivided into 13 chapters and further enriched with an extensive apparatus of appendices and endnotes, the 9-11 Commission report has ever since its publication received strong recognition for its literary qualities. A case in point is the beginning of the first chapter, entitled We Have Some Planes. That's a sentence that was part of an alleged radio communication from American Airlines flight number 11, hijacker pilot Mohammed Atta to ground control. Note the introduction of various key characters and settings that is clearly reminiscent of establishing shots from a thriller movie. Tuesday, September 11, 2001, dawned temperate and nearly cloudless in the eastern United States. Millions of men and women readied themselves for work. Some made their way to the Twin Towers, the signature structures of the World Trade Center complex in New York City. Others went to Arlington, Virginia, to the Pentagon. Across the Potomac River, the United States Congress was back in session. At the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, people began to line up for a White House tour. In Sarasota, Florida, President George W. Bush went for an early morning run. For those heading to an airport, weather conditions could not have been better for a safe and pleasant journey. Among the travelers were Muhammad Atta and Abdul Aziz Al-Omari, who arrived at the airport in Portland, Maine. Another instance can be found in the terminating paragraphs of the same first chapter. This is a new type of war, remarks an assistant to his superior in the North American Aerospace Defense Command at two minutes past ten, that is, a few minutes after the first of the Twin Towers had collapsed. If the nameless assistant enters the report not to provide analysis, but to dramatize it, as critic Alan Nadel concludes in his close reading of the Commission report, the following sentences contain another instrument from conventional fiction and film script writing, the cliffhanger. He was and is right, resumes the text with reference to the new type of war statement. But the conflict did not begin on 9-11. It had been publicly declared years earlier, most notably in a declaration faxed early in 1998 to an Arabic language newspaper in London. Few Americans had noticed it. 
The fax, fax had been sent from thousands of miles away from, by the followers of a Saudi exile gathered in one of the most remote and impoverished countries on Earth. Full stop period here, and more than that, end of paragraph and end of chapter one. As conventionalized ever since the TV episodes of Dallas, the cliffhanger, named after Dallas character Cliff Barnes, comes to be resumed at the very beginning of the subsequent episode or chapter. So does the mysterious Saudi exile in his as yet unidentified impoverished country. I quote again. In February 1998, the second chapter starts, the 40-year-old Saudi exile Usama bin Laden and a fugitive Egyptian physician, Ayman al-Sawahiri, arranged from their Afghan headquarters for an Arabic newspaper in London to publish what they had termed, what they termed a fatwa. I think I could easily present more examples of this kind, yet for one I do not want to bomb and bore you with similar and similarly obvious evidence. And for second, even if I wanted to, I cannot well reclaim the discovery and literary analysis of these instances exclusively for myself. Craig Warren, in an article of 2007, and, uh, seven, and just mentioned Alan Nadel, have already searched the report for fragments and structures known from fiction literature and partly so film analysis. Approaching the issue from the angle of an empirically oriented reader response critic, Warren leaves no stone unturned to demonstrate how the US reading public received the 9-11 report as an improbable literary triumph and declared it to be of enduring literary value due to its interpretative openness and multi-generic character. Readers have thus received it, Warren states, as simultaneously a trauma memoir, mystery novel, espionage, thriller, confessional, legal brief, episodic history, cautionary tale, mystery, uh, and work of fantasy, sorry. At the same time, Warren pinpoints the reflective tone of the work, interpreting this in true Wolfgang Iserian reader response style as a prerequisite for the active role it offered the reader to play in the narrative. Warren's conclusion is celebratory as far as the overall achievement of the report is concerned. By reaching out to their audience with plain and inclusive writing, the commissioners delivered an unmis unmistakable message that 9-11 could, not, could uh, not only change the sound and rhythm of state-sponsored sponsored prose, but also close the distance between the American people and their government. Alan Nadel, in turn, refrains from quasi-patriotic assessments and reconciliatory remarks in the direction of the Bush administration. Instead, he analyzes the report in terms of a cleverly contrived and well-made text, largely composed and shaped by the commission's executive director, Philip Zelikoff and his staff, which is aimed at sedating the American audience in the light of the numerous failures, fateful delays, and dysfunctionalities that have facilitated and involuntarily co-enabled the terror events. Control over what happened, Nadel says, suddenly got lost on the morning of September 11. The report, he goes on, seeks to make up for that by re-narrating the events and their circumstances with an authoritative voice that substitutes authorial control for exactly what the report and the people who authorized it <coughs> lack, control of events. Nadel fuses this particular result of his close reading and his acid critique of the top echelons in the government and the commission with the narrative concepts and other characteristics of postmodern writing. As a reader, we never get to the truth why 9-11 happened, why it could happen, Nadel sums up in a slightly conspirational manner because the report accumulates too many aspects and facets that do not fit in a single, illuminatingly clear and all-explaining picture. Brown witnesses from the postmodernist Department of Literature are invoked as role models for the report's, text, for the report's textual strategy. Thus, the report's structure is pinchonesque. It ventriloquizes Joseph Heller in a number of absurd reconstructions of absurdly catch-22-like communications between, for example, Vice President Cheney and President Bush. Or it has its moment of 
also typically postmodernist, metafictionality, when at one point the alleged chief author, Zalikov, appears as a character in his own narrative. At certain points in their analysis, Warren and Nail go beyond the level of text and text analysis and draw conclusions with, which include the context of the report, the commissioners and the US administration of the time, that is, or the persistently obscuring or reconciling effects empirically proven or speculatively uh, presumed that the document was supposed to have on the American public. I may, in the second half of my presentation, follow that same lead and will point at the possibly calculated effects and consequences of the abrupt and surprising reassessment of a commission report as a catchy narrative using the tricks and devices of bestseller fiction. Framing or reframing the report by adding the widely familiar conventions of popular literature and film may at first sight appear inadequate given the disastrous, the disastrous nature of the event or referent that lies at the core of the investigations conducted by the commission and the text document it produced. The occurrences were just too deadly serious for more than 3,000 people and have inflicted too much pain on those they left behind one might argue, to be treated in an as-if manner and thus warrant the vicarious pleasures that fiction literature has in store for its consumer readers. At second sight, however, the elusive use of elements from popular fiction formats, such as thrillers or, for that matter, graphic novels, as you can gather from the slides, a graphic adaptation of, of the 9-11 Commission report appeared as early as in 2006, so the use of elements from popular fiction formats may find explanation and presumably even legitimation on another level than the strictly literary or literary critical. I will, for the remainder of my talk, attempt the reformulation of the report's fictional underpinnings and its resemblance with products from the entertainment and culture, history, uh, culture industry in the framework provided by cultural critic and media theorist Jean Baudrillard. The key feature of Baudrillard's analysis of today's media-saturated societies is, as we all know, his presumption that reality, that is, real occurrences taking place in real settings, have increasingly come to be absorbed in and ultimately replaced by their medial correspondent, be it an image, a copy, or a product of the notorious virtual reality. The final stage of this development consists of the severing of the connection between a real event and its medial representation, the concept of reference now being obsolete, and the replacement of reality along with its underpinnings of factuality, historical or contemporary, by what he terms the hyperreal, or realm of simulacra. Associated with the media-engendered hyperreal, are the principles of the imaginary or fictional and their preeminent forms and generic formats such as fairy tales, heroic sagas or utopias, substituting as they do for everyday conventional reality. Notably, as we all know, Baudrillard identifies the United States as the most advanced media-saturated place on the globe. A diagnosis of, his mid, uh, of the mid-1980s which has subsequently led, among other things, to lively debates and contestations at a German and Austrian-American studies conferences. I'm thinking of a, an essay collection of 2000 edited by uh, Elisabeth Kraus and Caroline Auer, for instance. So, to put it in Baudrillard's own words, America is neither dream nor reality. It is a hyper-reality. It is a hyper-reality because it is a utopia which has behaved from the very beginning as if it had already been achieved. It does not come as a great surprise that Baudrillard, the cultural critic who identifies America as a case in point for his simulacrum and hyperreality hypothesis, was the first to be challenged by the occurrences of September 11. Ordinary reality violently broke in again, it seemed, when the planes crashed into the buildings. Hyperreality dissolved, it appeared, under the pressure of the events, and fiction cataclysmically turned into cruel, non-fictional reality when people discovered 
that a role model such as the blockbuster movie Towering Inferno of 1974 had been hijacked by those like Muhammad Atta, who stripped the disaster film of its imaginary cloaks, turned it into reality. Baudrillard had a hard time clinging to his theories, and I argue that his first response, an essay entitled The Spirit of Terrorism, which was published as early as some seven weeks after September 11, lacked in persuasiveness. The collapse of the towers of the World Trade Center is unimaginable. He, for instance, feebly, I think, defends himself, but that is not enough to make it a real event. Elsewhere, he acknowledges the criticism that can now be raised against his thesis, but he does so only to turn the tables back against those challenging him and, ultimately, insists on the correctness of his diagnosis. In this present case, September 11, one might perceive, maybe with a certain relief, a resurgence of the real and of the violence of the real in a supposedly virtual universe. This is the end of all your virtual story. That is real. Similarly, one could perceive a resurrection of history after its proclaimed death. But does reality really prevail over fiction? If it seems so, it is because reality has absorbed the energy of fiction and become fiction itself. One could almost say that reality is jealous of fiction, that the real is jealous of the image. It is as if they duel to find which is the most unimaginable. Interpreting the disastrous events in Lower Manhattan, Washington and Shanksville in terms of a rivalry between their, their realness and fiction and concluding that for once reality has seized that energy which otherwise, at least in America, at least for Baudrillard, remains reserved for fiction, the virtual or the realm of simulacra at first sight appears quaint and even quixotic. Yet, and this is my final point, the appearance of the 9-11 Commission report three years later, endowed as it is with precisely those elements which Baudrillard highlights in his cultural diagnosis of America, casts a new and different light on the reconcilability of his radical analysis of contemporary media societies and the events of September 11. It is in fact the, uh, the report itself, I argue, that resubstantiates Baudrillard's position at least to a certain degree. A document produced in and thus speaking from the very center of America and speaking to Americans in a quantitatively as well as qualitatively more than satisfying way, the 9-11 Commission report reads like a novel and as such shifts the issue that is at stake, if only slightly, away from its unbearable realness and into the direction of its counterpart, the hyperreal, which according to Baudrillard is likewise inspired by fictions and the fictional. Fictions now that are, however, less reminiscent of utopia, achieved or other, but rather of the dystopian kind. Now to conclude, I would not go as far as identifying a simulacrifying element inherent in the 9-11 report. Much as Baudrillard, aficionados, cultural pessimists and other Overt or covered critics of the United States and their people might consent to that, I insist that the report is a multifaceted and multigeneric literary achievement, but one with a clearly recognizable basis of origin. It is and remains a commission report. Its undertones of thriller, mystery, disaster and other novels or movies, as well as their adaptation, welcomed as it was by commission chair Thomas Keane as a graphic novel, are however too conspicuous to be disregarded and discarded again. They rehabilitate Baudrillard's diagnosis, harshly criticized as it was after 9-11, without assigning it full and unchallengeable validity. A narrative form which way more American citizens will be familiar with than the stilted prose of conventional commission reports, it allows for interpretations of its function in terms of a comprehensive and comprehensible literal text guide for a collective working through of the incisive occurrences in the US American homeland. To the degree that its authors had right from the start calculated with a rich and unanimously positive reception of the report as not only a piece of nonfiction but a page turner reminiscent of popular literature, its writers 
have demonstrated that the poeticization of politics is, within limits, a usable, useful, and for them and their, uh, their purposes, somehow also welcome instrument. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>